Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes. Welcome to the International Research Seminar hosted by the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the British University in Egypt and uh, organized by the Research Center for Irish Studies at the BUE, whose director is uh, Dr. Rania Rafi Khalil. And thank you, Dr. Rania, for this opportunity. Well, I'm, I'm Professor Shadja Fahim. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and it is a pleasure to host uh, you this evening. And thank you everyone for joining us. Today's uh, research seminar is titled The Reception of the Myths of Medea, Federa and Hecuba in Irish Contemporary Theater, Marina Cars by the Bog of Cats, Federa Backwards and Hecuba. The duration of the research seminar is approximately 60 minutes, including questions and answers. Our moderator for this evening is Dr. Mervat Shukri, the head of the uh, English department at the Faculty of Arts at the BUE. Welcome Dr. Mervat with us. Thank you, Dr. Mervat. I'll just um, uh, yani introduce uh, uh, Dr. Maria and then we can start. And we hope that our students, uh, uh, early career researchers, established academics uh, will find much to take away from this uh, seminar for the future research. Well, our guest speaker, Dr. Maria Gonzalez uh, Chacon, is assistant lecturer at the Department of English, French, and German Philology of the University of Oviedo uh, in Spain, where she teaches English language and literature. Her main areas of research are very interesting, actually. They're the contemporary Irish theater with special interest in the plays of Marina Carr and her rewriting of Greek myths the translations and adaptations of Spanish plays by Irish playwrights, and with a focus on the theater are uh, Federico uh, Gracia in Ireland. She also works in teaching innovation. Her latest publication uh, is the concept of the edge in the plays of Marina Carr, uh, as well as many others. Um, well, she has been a visiting researcher at Moore Research Institute, National University of Ireland, Galway, and uh, the Institute of Irish Studies, Queen's University, Belfast, and Women's Studies Center, University of York. She has been the vice president of Association of Young Researchers on Anglophone Studies, and is the secretary of um, Archivum Journal of Philology. Uh, welcome again, Dr. Uh, Maria, and we're looking forward um, to this uh, seminar. Um, our moderator this evening is Dr. Merva Chokri. She is the head of the Department of English Language and Literature at the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the BUE. She's an associate professor of English Language and Literature, and she's with us this evening particularly because she specializes in drama. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not only because she's our head of department, so Dr. Shukri's main research interests are literature, specifically drama, theatre and performance studies, British and world drama in relation to theories of psychoanalysis, eco-criticism, ethnicity, across border theatre, as well as adaptations of world drama to other cultures. She has published in national and international journals and conference proceedings. In addition, she is interested in language teaching, critical thinking and methods of blended learning. Dr. Shukri, has a lot of previous work before the BUE, uh, but we'll get that in the bios at the end of the seminar. But Dr. Shukri is also a Fulbright scholar who frequently participated in alumni events and presented at various national and international educational cultural bodies and conferences, including at George Washington University, the University of Massachusetts, the American Embassy's Regional Cultural Center, and the American Aid Program. So, um, Dr. Mervat, would you like to start with the synopsis for Dr. Maria so she can yes. kickstart the seminar? Yes, sure. Yes, sure. Thank you, Dr. Rani, for the introduction. Uh, and welcome, Dr. Maria. Uh, we're so much interested in attending and learning about that and knowing how, um, I mean, the connection goes on with what you've been doing regarding the myths and uh, with Maria, uh, Marina Carr. 
Let me just introduce your presentation. I'll introduce the synopsis. Uh, well, the seminar will address the reception uh, the re reception of the myths of Medea, Phaedra, and Hecuba, and in Irish contemporary theatre through the plays of Marina Carr, By the Block of Cats, 1998, Phaedra Backwards, 2011, and Hecuba, 2015. It will be introduced by, first, a revision of the latest works concerning the relationship between Irish contemporary theatre and Greek tragedies. And secondly, some references concerning specific literature published about the theater of Ka. After that, Ma will offer an analysis of the three myths with a special interest in the concept of the edge, the temporality, and the redemption of female characters. Well, Dr. Marina, uh, uh, Dr. Maria, the floor is yours, and we're <laughs> looking you. forward to your presentation. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you. So good evening. Um, everyone and first of all I would like to uh, express my uh, gratitude to the uh, British University in Egypt, to the Faculty of uh, Arts and uh, Humanities, especially to uh, Professor Shadia Fahim, the Dean of the Institution, uh, to the moderator Dr. Uh, Merwad uh, Shukri, and of course to uh, the Research Centre for Iris Studies to uh, Rania for organizing and contacted, uh, having contacted me some months ago in order to participate in this seminar. So as you have said, I will start by uh, offering a brief introduction about uh, the author and the relationship between her theater and Greek myths uh, before analyzing the strategies that uh, she uses to, to rewrite uh, those myths. And uh, these are uh, the works, the latest works uh, concerning the relationship between uh, Irish contemporary theatre and uh, Greek uh, tragedies. Um, first of all, amid our travels, I versions of uh, Greek uh, tragedies, uh, 2002. Secondly, Rebel Women, the stage in ancient Greek drama today. 2005, Dissident Dramaturgy's Contemporary Irish Theatre in 2010, and in the same year, uh, Irish Appropriation of Greek Tragedy. And I will also make some brief references to the literature of Marina Carr, specifically to three volumes that uh, have been published so far, devoted to specifically to, to her theatre, the theatre of Marina Carr, before rules was made, 2003, Bloody Living, The Loss of Selfhood in the Place of Marina Carr, 2010, and most recently, Marina Carr, Patches of the, of the Unknown in 2019. And to uh, start with the first uh, volume that I would like to, to, to revise uh, briefly, uh, I would like to say that Marina Carr has been referred to as a, as a classicist, a classicist who is uh, entranced uh, by the power of Greek uh, mythology. In the volume that you have there, Amid Our Travels, uh, Irish versions of Greek tragedies, Eamon Jordan makes reference to the ability of Marina Carr to adapt the myths. And he argues that Marina Carr unmasks uh, the myth, for instance, in uh, By the Bark of Cats or On Rafter's uh, Hill, her earliest plays. And Jordan identifies uh, Marina Carr's uh, representation of the complexities of the Irish society, disturbing the, the, the audiences through her attempt to bring, to bring back myth uh, and causing a formidable intensity of encounter and uh, disjunction. And he explains these moments of encounter and disjunction in the following terms. The moments of encounter or, or, or the moments of engagement would uh, correspond or would be uh, those uh, shared themes that can be seen, for instance, in the similarities of the plots of Marina Carr's Midland tragedies, The May, Portia Kaflan, and By the Bark of Cats, with the myths of Electra, Antigone, or Medea. And the instances of uh, disjunction would be, or would make reference to Marina Carr um, reconstruction of modern female mythological uh, characters, as these uh, would be different from, from uh, their classical uh, 
counterparts. Secondly, Melissa Sierra, one of the greatest experts in the theater of Marina Carr, addresses Carr's relationship with the Greek tragedy in the volume that we have uh, there, Rebel Women Stage in Ancient Greek Drama Today. And she <laughs> identifies Marina Carr as a rebel woman who is able to draw a connection between the Athens of the fifth century and the uh, uh, island of the 20th and 21st century. And Syrah sees Carr's use of myth as a possibility to open new spaces uh, for imagination and transformation, especially for Irish women who, as it happened in the Greek society, have been long relegated to the uh, domestic space. And one of the reasons for the loss, the, this loss of uh, identity is that uh, women in Ireland have been used as uh, cultural representations, especially uh, at moments of social and political uh, upheaval, and this uh, has affected their status. They were expected to be at the service of the community and consequently lost uh, agency. This idea has been studied by uh, the Spanish scholar uh, Aida Rosende Pérez, who revised the feminine uh, iconography of Ireland as a mother, and concluded that uh, it had uh, generated a model of Irish women as martyrs who willingly sacrificed for their nation or for her nation and children. And therefore Irish women found themselves trapped in what Rosende calls um, roles reduccionistas y, y, y opresores, or so in English reductionist and oppressive roles. So this has influenced Carr's depiction of brave women who define stereotypical images and who do not accommodate, but continually renegotiate boundaries, or boundaries of place, uh, of authority and of uh, identity. So uh, consequently, there is a, a lack of conformism in, in Marina Carr's uh, characters. And this has been confirmed by Imun Jordan when uh, he readdresses Carr's uh, appropriation of Greek myths and reaches some useful conclusions in the volume Dissident Dramaturgies, Contemporary uh, Irish Theatre. First, uh, Marina Carr for uh, Jordan can put the spectator in a space that is outside social norms. And her theatre offers moments of pure savagery and beauty, while still uh, creating convincing dramas that are replete with uh, marginal characters who are full of longing. Secondly, the Greek influences are blatant for Jordan and Marina Carr's uh, tragedies. Women protagonists live in chaos and self-destruction reigns. And the new Irish uh, contemporary heroines are moved by a feeling of revenge, which uh, Jordan uh, calls the revenge of the dispossessed, making reference once more to the situation uh, of women in Ireland who have been damaged so badly that sometimes they replicate uh, the, 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 the violence they have suffered. Uh, and as a result, the, the, the human in part becomes animal and the animal becomes a human, as we will see in some of the characters that we will uh, revise in, in today's seminar. And following Jordan and Syrah's interest in Irish playwrights and the Greeks, Brian Arkins published in 2010, the Irish Appropriation of Greek Tragedy, where he notices the shift that was produced in the rewriting of tragedy from major European locations or what uh, he calls or to what he calls the peripheral regions such as Ireland. And he claims the existence of Irish tragedies, the concept of Irish tragedies and mentions Theresa Devi and Marina Carr as the greatest uh, representatives. And he establishes again this relationship between Ireland and Greece and concludes that there has been much debate on um, certain social issues in both contexts. And this can be exemplified in Ireland from the 1960 onwards due to the political and social issues that affected uh, women's situations, issues uh, related to religion, abortion, divorce, 
So in, our, in Brian Arkin's words, in this very volatile situation, Greek tragedy allows for the exploration of issues of nationalism, gender, and uh, resistance. And as we said at the very beginning, it is also relevant for our purpose today to revise uh, the most relevant literature on Marina Carr, apart from the a uh, considerable number of academic articles published on her works. Three volumes have been published specifically uh, dedicated to, to her theatre. The first of, of, of those volumes is the theatre of Marina Carr before rules was made, uh, which uh, focuses on the uh, Midland tragedies. Originally the May, Portia Kaplan and by the Book of Cats. Nowadays, the concept has been expanded to the Midland cycle and some scholars include here on Rafters Hill and Ariel. So authors such as Anthony Roche, Claire Wallace and Fran McGuinness reflect on the women protagonists and their mythological uh, connections to conclude that Marina Carr has a true love for the Greeks. Kathleen Leaney and Anna McMullen uh, state that she appropriates the rules of gender, character, dialogue or setting as she has inherited them and then reinvents them creating a dynamic space in which the determining social and theatrical norms of gender, property and identity become ironic and sometimes uh, monstrous distortions as he viewed from a dimension before rules was made. And they took the, the, the title from, from there. The second volume, this idea of the reinvention of the self was also the, also the core for uh, Rona Trench in a Bloody Living, um, the loss of selfhood uh, in the place of uh, Marina Carr. And she addresses Carr's theatre as a representation of the concept of self destruction in women, uh, following uh, the idea of uh, abjection taken from uh, Julia Kristeva. And the self destructive nature of the characters is encouraged by the limitations or borders that surround them. We will see this in the, in the first play that we will analyze. And that come to reveal a disruption to the margins of their identity, a disruption that places subjectivity continuously on the verge of collapse. Thus, within those spaces, women refuse to accommodate and prefer to descend in search for their identity, as we will see in the three plays. The volume addresses uh, this theme in the Midland tragedies, but also in Carr's first plays, which include Ulalu, Lo in the Dark, as well as her plays until 2009 on Rafters Hill, Ariel, Meat and Salt, a play for children, The Cordelia Dream, and Marble in 2009. And the uh, latest volume on the theater of Carr, um, I would like to make reference to is a uh, Marina Carr Pastures of the Unknown, 2019, written by Melissa Sira, as I said before, one of the greatest experts in the theater of Marina Carr. And Sira situates a uh, car as part of an Irish matriarchal genealogy of women playwrights initiated by Lady Gregory. And for Sira, both dramatists share their vision of Irish folklore, as well as an interest to depict strong women as protagonists of their plays, and the mix of the natural and the supernatural. Melissa Sira explains how Marina Carr explores female disaffection in terms of motherhood, the family, and the society, where the oppressiveness of patriarchy is set against questions of women's agency. And she adds the question of self-exile, the importance of nature and the outdoors in opposition to domestic spaces. And the idea that uh, the living death or the lack of fulfillment uh, rules sometimes these women's lives. Shira describes emotional landscapes of transformation, spaces they attach to myths which favor that empowered modes of uh, female subjectivity are inscribed upon the pastures of the unknown. So after this brief introduction about all this uh, literature about uh, Marina Carr, 
I will start with the analysis of the first play by the Bark of Cards, establishing the, uh, a, a relationship with Medea. And I would like to uh, read this uh, initial uh, quote by the protagonist, Hester, uh, because it encapsulates her essence, uh, as well as the focus on my analysis here, which is the construction by Carr of the concept of the edge as that space for resistance, uh, or uh, and at the same time, the space to, to reconstruct the myth. Hester says, I was born on the bark of cards, and on the bark of cards I lay my days. It holds me to it in ways it has never held years. And as for me tinker blood, I'm proud of it because it gives me an edge over all of years around here. So uh, Medea was in uh, classical uh, literature, the archetype of the barbarian woman, the sorceress, uh, conceived as um, immortal in some legends, married to Achilles in others, killer of her baby brother in some accounts. Euripides chooses Corinth as the setting for uh, his revision of the myth, and uh, Medea kills Jason, uh, Jason's new bride, and becomes the, the, also the slaughter of her own children to punish Jason for abandoning her. And Medea's Irish counterpart, according to Marina Carr, is renamed as Hester Swain, the female protagonist of By the Book of Gods. Uh, Hester has been with uh, Cartage for 14 years. They share a daughter, Josie, and a history of ambition. Cartage is now looking for respectability in the community and cannot include Hester in his plans anymore, as he wants to marry young Carolyn Cassidy, the daughter of a wealthy landowner. So Hester has always lived by the bog, where ironically, she's considered by her neighbors as an outsider. And through the analysis of the concept of the age and Hester's relationship to this, it is possible to unveil some of the strategies used by Carr to rewrite the myth. Carr builds a stronger woman who finds the strength in her bogland and who, despite living on the edge, can confront those who try to destroy her. She triumphs over the rest of the characters as the only one who has the courage to live passionately. She has the heroism of staying and fighting rather than leaving the place that causes her so much suffering. And it is precisely such a refusal to abandon that creates spaces where individual, individuals may be most alive. And Hester finds those, uh, uh, those spaces uh, in the book. Edges that can be identified as places of a struggle for women's uh, identity, but also spaces of resistance. The caravan where Hester used to live and where she still sleeps frequently, as she does not feel that a, a house is, is a home for her, is symbolically placed on the side or edge of the bog. And we need to take into account here that Irish bogs have traditionally shaped Irish landscapes and are still nowadays perceived as magical uh, spaces or in between uh, spaces because they retain the quality of liminal spaces where these uh, dichotomies coexist. And Hester embraces this place precisely as her home, not a house. Moreover, the power of the landscapes that surround her acquires uh, importance, and Hester wishes the age of ice would return and do away with, uh, with us all like dinosaurs. And Hester echoes the image of the classical Ovidian symbiosis with nature when she states that she knows every burrow and rivulet and bog hole in, of its nine square mile where the best rosemary grows. So the situation of the edge in the bog and the bog in the edge can metaphor the existence of a different irisness that claims its right uh, to exist in a different uh, space and inhabited by uh, different uh, characters. The mysterious of stage worlds add to the picture and are present in the form of living ghosts, such as the spirit of Joseph Swain, Hester's brother, who walks across the stage asking to uh, come back to life. 
and the character of the ghost fancier who comes from another world and wants to take her story with her. References to witchery add to this dimension and Hester, for instance, is called the Jezebel witch. And when she burns Dow Cartridge's house, she's warned a hundred years ago with a strap you to a stake and roast you. Finally, the presence of shrines and dreams evoke mythic and spiritual experiences. When Hester first comes on the stage, she's accompanied by a swan, the old black wind. But what could be a mythic and idyllic image of Irishness is disrupted by the trail of blood left by the corpse of the bird in the snow, as if announcing the impending catastrophe that is going to, to happen, the tragedy. So it is in this combination of the magical and the spiritual where the mysterious emotional realities of Hester uh, exist to create another space of resistance. Carr associates the bog a place considered to encapsulate Irishness with Hester, a character who has deep roots, as, as, as has the bog in Ireland, but who is unwanted anyway. So Marina Carr is posing questions of the different types of Irishness and their validity at the same time that she rewrites uh, the myth. And the, anim the animalization of, of the characters who inhabit traditional spaces helps the Irish media explain her decisions. Edges are also articulated through references to the dark, wild side of people, which are apocalyptically announced by Hester when she warns the community about her broken identity or and her sense of dislocation. She says, there is two Hester strains, one that is decent and very fond of you, despite your callow treatment of me, and the other Hester, well, she could slide a, a, a knife down your face. Additionally, those who celebrate Cartridge and Carolyn's wedding are compared to gargoyles to symbolize their evilness. And Hester herself can feel something wild growing inside. She says, there is something about me you never understood and makes you afraid. And you are right for other things go through my veins besides blood. When Hester uh, ultimately kills her daughter, she begins to, to wail, a terrible animal wail. So the play's fatal ending, which includes Hester's own suicide, seems coherent with her determination not to conform. However, her death and that of her child, Josie, is not a pure act of revenge, as it was interpreted in the case of Medea. Hester's death can be argued to symbolize the triumph of nonconformity over ostracism, the triumph of a rebellion that seemed doomed to defeat by the rest of the community. And from this perspective, Hester kills Josie, so she does not have to cross the line and leave outside the bog and inside uh, the community that uh, damaged her. The second play that we will discuss today is Phaedra Backwards. Marina Carr uh, focuses on the exploration of the feelings of guilt, which ultimately will cause uh, Phaedra's death. As we can read in the initial quote, I would like to start again with a quote by the protagonist, Marina Carr's Phaedra says, you misunderstand me, you misunderstand everything. This is not about love. This is about guilt and terror. My two trusting eyes will see me to my lonely grave. So the plot of Phaedra backwards goes uh, beyond a woman who falls in love with a younger man. It reimagines the myth as the uh, story of a woman who has gained agency and through the memories of her past, reconstructs her present and performs an attempt to control her future. To achieve this backwards and forwards fluidity, the play starts where previous accounts had ended. And with Phaedra as the protagonist, after hearing about Hippolyta's death, Phaedra, in an attempt to reconstruct her identity, remembers the difficult moments she spent with her brother, the Minotaur, and with her husband, Theseus, and how this marked her life. 
Moreover, she unveils Hippolyta's violent attitude towards her and reveals her deep love for her husband as some of the causes that triggered uh, her tragedy. Uh, so with this same intention of reconstructing or contributing to the reconstruction of the identity of Phaedra, Marina Carr places her in the title uh, of the uh, play, followed by backwards, both to encapsulate the rhythm of the story and to empower her as the protagonist. In addition, she reorders the list of characters situating Phaedra in the first position and describing all the other characters supporting roles now according to their relationship with her. And it is significant in this respect to mention that she eliminates uh, Phaedra's description as wife and mother, which was present in the classical version, and that the number of female characters has been increased. Uh, we have now Arisha, the girl, Pacifi, Ariadne, and the nanny, to create another example of Marina Carr's women uh, genealogies. So the place is based uh, on the Greek myth, but situated in modern times. It is not located in Ireland, although some instances of the Irish vernacular can be identified. And it differs in the sense from Carr's previous revisions of Greek tragedies. Uh, now she, she, she intended to achieve uh, something different. Marina Carr said, I wanted uh, a timeless quality to Phaedra backwards. It seemed to me that nothing was to be gained uh, by nailing it down time-wise or geographically. And the myth uh, has a timelessness about it. And I was trying to respond to that in the truest way I knew. So as regards the time for the play, Marina Carr considers that it should be now and then, then and now, always. And thus, the characters travel backwards and forwards to rewrite the myth in their search for identity. And we find characters uh, from the past, and we find those who live in the present, and we find those who move between the past and the present. Uh, from the past, we have those who died and decide to visit again the world of the living. These are uh, Pacifi, Minos, and Ariadne. Pacifi is now a woman obsessed with the white bull, but unashamed of her sexual desire. He says, what did you expect when you bring a force like that into our fields? In addition, she refuses to be a Penelope waiting eternally for her nervant husband. Uh, she says to, to, to her husband, uh, just what did you expect, embroidery? Well, this is what I stitched together while you were uh, away, making reference to, to her relationship with the white hood. Uh, absent in Euripides, except for a brief reference to her tortuous past, she has gained presence and agency in car. And her story with the white bull is reconstructed as a supernatural encounter which marked her life, but for good. She is essential in redefining, in addition, the mythological figure of the Minotaur, traditionally a beast and now seen uh, by her as an enchanted thing. Um, who swam in to drive me mad, but whose nature is good. Pacifa, in fact, prefers him to, to the human lot. And moreover, she redefines motherhood, also a key motif in Carl's theater, questions her role as a wife, which undermines her independence and freedom, and does not feel uh, obedience towards uh, her husband, Minos, who, by the way, has now become a sort of Odysseus, who, after being away for years, uh, hardly uh, recognizes uh, his daughters when he comes back. And the character of Ariadne has also changed. She's a strong woman who reclaims her right to take revenge on Phaedra and reproaches her for having uh, stolen her husband. In addition, she joins the Minotaur, Pacifi, and Minos in a disturbing scene when they, uh, where they uh, arrange around Phaedra, who has been hanged, and start taking uh, bites from her flesh. Now, we do not have in, in Marina Carr's play Hippolytus' death, uh, as it has been uh, had been uh, told in classical accounts, caused by the huge bull arising from a mass of water. Um, it, this scene uh, has been substituted here by the blood and, and, and roars from this scene, which is uh, preceded by the Minotaur's statement that 
they will have what we need in the end. And minus a statement that why you should leave when we don't, while they attack Phaedra, which symbolized the opposition from other mythological figures to Phaedra's salvation through the representation of this uh, cannibalistic uh, appropriation of, of her essence. So these were the characters uh, from the past, but we also have the characters from the present in the play. Those are uh, Phaedra, Theseus, and Hippolytus. And when Theseus tries to blame Phaedra for her death of Pison, as he did in the classical play, Phaedra is not ashamed or afraid of losing her reputation, as it happened with the classical counterpart. Quite the opposite. She responds arrogantly to rewrite the story of her husband as a decrepit old man, his glorious past is over. And by station to destroy the image of the classical patriarchal family, which belongs to the past, uh, according to Marina Carr, to last night. And uh, there is a quote here uh, by Phaedra, last night you weren't standing up for me, you weren't ranting about yourself and your battered car car carcass, uh, a, a statement to, to her husband. And Phaedra is always straightforward as regards uh, feelings, and she's proud of, of her uh, difference, as, as Hester was by the Book of Gods. She rejects judgments and claims her right to have an existence of her own, far from the immutability imposed by the myth. Uh, Phaedra says, I refuse your verdict on me, I refuse this life. This, no, this non existence by the shore, I'm not a mermaid. And as the other women in the play, she contributes to reconstruct the figure of the Minotaur by unfolding again his human side. And she's the one who tells how he bled, how he suffered, and he loved, questioning those traditional readings of him as the representation of evil. A negative depiction of masculinity is embodied in the character of Hippolytus, now in love with Phaedra, uh, establishing the difference with the classical play, but dating Arisha at the same time, questioning again the romantic love present in, in previous accounts. Hippolytus shows some interest in Phaedra, but insofar as having her would imply a sort of prize for him. And this is much influenced by his rivalry relationship with his father, which is well explained by the end of the play, where far from the reconciliation that we had in the classical account, they end up unmasking the real thoughts about each other. And while for Theseus, Hippolytus is a rant, a nothing, a dreamer of crimes, Hippolytus accuses him of uh, plundering. And Theseus is not finally redeemed, consequently, as he was in Euripides, for instance, but cursed by the Minotaur. And finally, moving constantly between the past and the present, as they trying desperately to find a space and a time to settle, we have the figure of the Minotaur absent in Euripides. He belongs here to the pastures of the unknown. And Cars uses Picasso's drawings of him um, as a background to, to emphasize uh, his mutability. This character travels backwards and forwards, as we said, to explain his nature, how he was removed from the love of his family, from Pacifa's uh, protection, and became a despised and abused creature, referred to as a thin and forced to live in caves. We have already explained how some characters rewrote him, especially Pacifi and Phaedra, and this reconceptualization is caused by the intention of a car to use him as the, as the personification of the imagination uh, itself, a visceral embodiment of intrinsic otherness. This spirituality and difference is also embodied in his ability to travel between the worlds of the living and the dead, as well as in his role as the one who carries Phaedra into another existence by the end of the play. In the final scene, the image on the screen is that of the Minotaur carrying Phaedra into the sea from where she will not return. 
So therefore, he implies a twist, another twist on the original European text and its previous interpretation, while his death has traditionally been understood as a metaphor for the end of the outrageous and the triumph of the human, now the half animal is perceived as a victim of the violent patriarchal system symbolized in the mistreatment he suffered from uh, Theseus. And to conclude with the seminar about the reception of Harry Smith in the place of uh, Marina Carr, I would like to uh, discuss some of the strategies used in Hecuba and start again with a quotation, this time a quotation by uh, Marina Carr, uh, who uh, stated that uh, she fundamentally disagreed with the idea of Hecuba killing her two little grandsons in revenge. I just never bought that, Marina Carr said. So I've rewriting my own version of what might possibly have happened um, on that uh, beach. So Marina Carr is represented uh, here, her belief that um, we are creatures of passion rather than rational beings. And Hecua has again been um, misrepresented through times as uh, Media or Hester and Phaedra. So Marina Carr here is mainly interested in the emotional passions, as we said, that moved Hecuba, and thus she is determined to, to unveil her most um, private thoughts. This is the space of, of recreation here in the dialogues of the play. And in order to achieve this, she uses the free reported speech through which each of the characters in the, in the play retell what the others say, and in addition, add their own uh, reinterpretations. There is no chorus due to this, and the different perspectives are confronted at, at, at all times in such a way that in this piece, everyone becomes everyone else's chorus. They comment on the, on the other uh, characters. And thus, uh, dramatis personae address the spectators directly, and this uh, brings a Greek tragedy closer to contemporary audiences. So reviewers saw in Carr's play a sharply contemporary resonance in the exploration of what it means to feel uh, powerless in, in a world dominated by military force. The word genocide resonates in the play and present day images such as that of the uh, three year old Syrian boy and refugee Ailan Kurdi, who drowned on September 2015 in the Eastern Mediterranean coast when his family was trying to reach Greece from Turkey, have been linked to Hecuba's young son, Polybius. And Hecuba has been seen here as the victimized embodiment of a rich Trojan culture, who commits no violence and who is very far from uh, Euripides' uh, furious uh, vindictive heroine. So the play opens not with the ghost of Polydorus' speech, as did uh, Euripides, but with Hecuba on a stage surrounded by um, blood and uh, pieces of bodies uh, from the corpses of uh, her dead um, sons. Priam, her husband, is lost, and her two daughters, Cassandra and Polyxena, accompany her in what is described as a Greek uh, genocide. And Hecuba says, so I'm in the throne room surrounded by the limbs, torsos, heads, corpses of my sons, my women trying to dress me, blood between my toes, my son's blood. And after this, cars, uh, car alters again the original plot and introduces Agamemnon, who is portrayed as a lustful monster from Emisene and a barbarian king. And he thwarts echo corruption and sexual harassment when he refers uh, to Hecuba, for instance. Hecuba, in addition, dismantles the mythical account which sustained that the destruction of Troy had been justified by explicitly asserting that Helen did not exist. It was an invention uh, from the Greeks who as colonizers needed an excuse to take her land. And other variations include 
Polymister's story, which happens in this version first, as he faces Agamemnon to respond for the disappearance of Hecuba's son. And he will have his own boys kidnapped by Agamemnon. And Cars gives him a voice in the form of a new narration to tell his own story and show both sides in a conflict, in a war. Another character who has gained prominence in this play is Cassandra. She is depicted as a woman that evokes uh, Cars' uh, previous female characters, the daughter who, who responds to a mother in a disdainful uh, tone. This relationship between mother and daughter is also a very common theme in Marina Carr's theater. The woman who openly states her lack of uh, familial uh, feelings when these impede her social privileges, and who talks blatantly about her desire uh, towards a young men. The inter-exchange that you have uh, there shows her disdain towards Hecuba, and also her ambition to become one of the invaders or colonizers herself. And this is followed by Odysseus and Agamemnon planning uh, Polyxena's sacrifice and sentence uh, Polydorus to death at the same time. And in the middle of the play, in such a way that the order of events is, is, is altered and both deaths are placed together, being the effect and increased sense of loss uh, for Hecuba, which is made explicit in her conversation with uh, Odysseus, where um, her supplication in classical account is substituted by a strong uh, complaint about uh, Polyxena's uh, sacrifice. Uh, you dare call this a law, she says. It is an atrocity on top of all the atrocities. You want to sacrifice my daughter to appease your savage gods. No proper god would ever ask such a thing. So Marina Carr makes Hecuba finally go with uh, Polyxena to the altar to explain better the suffering of a mother who sees her child uh, die. And she rewrites Polyxena as a terrified girl and Hecuba as a brave woman who accompanies her to death. And after having lost Polyxena, Cassandra, who is one of the choric figures in this play, rewrites Hecuba, definitely, uh, and starts to eliminate the false accounts of previous versions to leave only the grief of uh, Hecuba, as you can read it in the, in the quote there. My mother stands watching, speechless, she watches, as my sister is put in the flames. No hint of the fabled queen now. Uh, they said many things about her after. So this has been my, my uh, presentation, my seminar about these three plays. I have included here um, some bibliography, basically the articles from where I, um, I uh, obtained most of the information here, which are three articles that I uh, have uh, written during the last years. And I have also included some research uh, possibilities which we can discuss uh, later if you, if you consider. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Maria, for such an interesting and insightful presentation. Uh, which you presented how, I mean, now in the modern age, the uh, recreation or the reconstruction of Greek myth in Irish plays by Maria Carr. Um, and basically showing how both Irish and Greek female myths survive in the place of Carr. All right, and how this technique is uh, actually highlighting how mythology is in today's Irish theater and how it is used as a strategy to question actually the role of women in society. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, there's also the idea of how, how myth, how the use of myth actually uh, continues revealing that sometimes maybe inability of modern material society to substitute that issue of epic life uh, in, in, um, in the, of the individual. So however, um, the issues of loss of identity, the issue of how Carr recreates such myths 
in modern times. And as you said, also with different locations in the past and the present, right? And now with different even geographical locations. So how that is even adapted in the modern, um, I mean, modern world. And which shows how, I mean, those myths are created in, they're still there. So, so however, um, depending on how the writer deals with that and how she presents her vision, uh, regarding that, regarding the issues you mentioned in different plays, like the Greek genocide, like the characters of the past and present, uh, the archetype of uh, Medea, of the sorceress, etc., in By the Book of Cats. So, um, thank you for that. Let me just uh, g conclude that before we have some any questions, just to uh, round up what you said uh, regarding Maria Carr as a classicist who rewrites Greek tragedies in contemporary Ireland through the creation of moments of disjunction where she inserts spaces for the reinvention of the characters. Her Irish Medea Hester strives to leave on the edge. Phaedra goes backwards and forwards to explain her story and Hecuba speaks to the moment and shows the effect of all, which is your great, um, really good and insightful conclusion on that. Um, so, however, thank you for that. And now, if you don't mind, we would um, open the floor for any questions. If anybody would like to ask any questions to um, Dr. Maria, would anybody like to ask a question? Shall we just? Um, yeah, Dr. Mirva, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Please, please go ahead. Okay, Maria. Um, um, of course, yes, I, I wrote, I've got a publication on Marina Cars by the Bog of Cats. All right. Right. Okay. So, of course, I was, uh, you know, quite excited when when you're going to give this analysis, and you touched on a number of points, which was living on the edge and um, the off off the stage worlds and animalization of the characters. Those three points. Now, I did. I mean, your analysis, and you linked that to Greek mythology, which I didn't. I looked at it from a completely different perspective. Oh, and really. Well, not in the terms, I didn't look at the myths. I didn't analyze All right. the myths. I mean, I, I, I simply um, decided to target, target the characters um, from a more, more of a, like a modern, modern woman who actually- All right. But you've actually touched on that when you talked about living on the edge. And you also talked about her death and her daughter's death. And what caught my attention, you said this was not revenge, because that was my argument. I mean, is her death really? and her daughter's yes, and her daughter's death, is that revenge? And for me, I, I didn't think it was revenge. I thought it was transcending um the ugliness yes. of, and the limitations of the social constraints she was exactly uh, tied by. And that was her way of liberating herself and taking away from her daughter um, a fate that would have probably um, turned her into an animal. Now, I didn't exactly. talk about in my in my analysis about animalization of the characters, but after hearing your analysis and your um, discussion on it, yes, I mean, she did become quite animalistic, particularly when she burnt down um, the homes and she turned everything with it like as if she was a witch. Um, can I just also ask about, you You said that um, Marina Carr, oh, or in the play, they've turned the, the attendees of the wedding as gargoyles. Now, that must have slipped <laughs> my, that must have slipped my, 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 my analysis. How did you come to that conclusion? Why did you call them gargoyles? Because it is mentioned in the play. Oh, really? Oh, goodness. <laughs> yes, it is. It is indeed. Okay, it is indeed. Okay, I don't remember right now if it was um, Hester who, who called them gargoyles, okay, in one of those moments where she uh, was uh, really, really um, angry, okay. But that is also very interesting, the, the, the study of uh, the animalization of the characters, because it happens in, in By the Book of Cards, but uh, I didn't have much time. But if you analyze the figure of the Minotaur mm -hmm. and how uh, also it is suggested by many of the characters that the Minotaur is not uh, the animal of the play, the monster. OK, we can also relate this to Frankenstein and this idea of who is the, who is the monster, OK? Mm -hmm. And is something that a uh, car questions in in many of of her plays. Okay, and yes, my my focus is always on the on the 
uh, spaces of reconstructions for for the myth okay because i i studied I studied that, but I think your your approach is very interesting. Also, I'm very happy that you also read the 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 ending of of uh, Hester and Josie in, in with that meaning, which I also consider that appears in many other plays by by Marina Carr. The yes. endings yes. of women entering water. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's also can also be be uh, studied and analyzed because I think it also has a relationship to Greek times and. And even the entrance in the, I, I, I once thought maybe Marina Carr is uh, trying to suggest the entrance in the mythological realm for, for these women as the only possibility for, for, for a space to, to exist in order to emphasize the difference with the real society where they cannot, it is impossible for them to, to accommodate. They do not find a space in the real world. So I find that this mythological and spiritual and supernatural worlds might have that meaning too. And that is something that uh, I usually study. And I didn't have time to, to, to mention the research possibilities, but it is also um, very interesting to, to, to study the, the rewriting of Iphigenia in Ariel or uh, the May as a rewriting of Penelope for instance, okay. And also very interesting now the interest by Marina Carr about the, the, the place of Federico García Lorca. She has written a, a, a version of a Blood Wedding, which I am uh, starting to, to study now. I have already studied a version by Frank McGuinness of La Casa de Bernarda Alba, the house of Bernarda Alba which was very interesting and I'm, I'm, I'm now also interested in, in that relationship between Lorca, Federico García Lorca, who is one of the greatest uh, playwrights in, in Spain and, and his relationship with, with Ireland and why it, uh, some Irish playwrights nowadays are finding uh, Lorca so interesting. Thank you. Yes, well, well, well thank you for that. Um... I mean, different interpretation as well. I mean, because uh, different lit that, that shows how literature is always open to new and different approaches uh, of our uh, of analysis, and such analysis actually enriches the depth of meaning in the plays. It it gives new, I mean, uh, let's say new horizons whereby one could see how, how that could be seen in different ways, in different um, uh, approaches, in different uh, means. So it, it does affect the, uh, the continuous interpretation of plays, you know, every now and then. So thank you for that comment. Thank you very much. Um, so are there any further questions? Would anybody like to ask Dr. Can Maria? Someone wants to say something. Yes. <laughs> Um, well, if that may I speak, can you? Yes, sure, please, you're uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Maria, for a very interesting and beautifully paced paper. Uh, very complex <laughs> ideas presented in a very approachable way, so, so thank you for that. Um, you've, you've written, if I'm, I'm relying on memory here, but you've written on the Sharabang Theatre and you've written on Augusta Gregory. Uh, but I, I get a feeling that you're sort of homing in on Marina Carr. And I wonder if we could explore that a little bit, what, what's happening there. Uh, one of the, the things that, that I have, I want to think about is Marina Carr seems to me, more than anything else, to put extraordinarily powerful parts for women on the stage and extraordinarily powerful parts for women are actually quite rare in Irish theatre. Mostly we, we have versions of long-suffering Ireland personified by a woman and Marina Carr is doing something different. But what I want to wonder about is how far are these texts for you, pieces of theatre? I mean, how given the way the work is now reaching us. So I have seen very few Marina Carl plays on stage, and I don't expect mm. to see many more in my lifetime. What is your approach to that problem? 
to the to the fact that her plays are not being performed. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I I didn't know really that they were not much performed in 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 Ireland because uh, well you I see live... them in Ireland. I live in England and uh, oh right okay uh, so you're talking about England okay you're right because I think in Ireland they they are performed okay quite often and also abroad okay and for instance here in Spain yeah. they have uh, released a uh, a reel like, I don't know, two or three years ago in, in Madrid, okay, one of the most important theatres, okay. Uh, I think, uh, Marina Carr, is essential in what you have said in writing about women, okay, and in uh, speaking the unspeakable for women, okay. Mm. And I can understand that maybe um, their plays are not very easy to, to, to see and to, and to understand. Uh, when you read about those women, um, and for instance, when you have a rural background, for instance, in my case, I have a rural background, okay, and uh, I have also spoken to or read some of the reviews of the plays, and they say that it's very difficult from, for uh, women uh, when they feel identified with some of the uh, issues that uh, she deals with, okay. Uh, I think it is very, very important that um, her plays are more and more read and more and more performed and uh, that uh, her importance is recognized okay which i think it is abroad for instance here in spain she is considered as one of the greatest irish playwrights okay and here at my university her plays are read okay and are studied okay within the courses of Irish theatre, sorry, not of Irish theatre, Anglophone theatre, okay, mm -hmm. and she's one of the greatest, I think one of the few Irish women playwrights that we uh, study here with our students, okay, so I think her role is essential in that sense, and as regards my interest, I wrote my thesis, my PhD thesis about uh, the theatre of Marina Carr, like 10 years ago, okay, that's why uh, I write mainly about her, okay? I try also to study the uh, Irish contemporary theater in general. I also wrote, as you said, about Caravan because I'm interested about the different theaters that exist in Ireland. Right now I'm uh, writing something about uh, Shane McAmbeard, who is a, a new uh, playwright who is writing about uh, concerns, new concerns in Irish society, for instance, the importance of the environment. But I always keep that relationship with Marina Carr uh, because I have followed all her plays and I continue following uh, all her works because I found them uh, beautiful, okay? As, as uh, she said, or some of, of her characters, uh, sometimes it is monstrous what they say and what you see and what you have to listen but it is necessary and from a woman's perspective and from a rural woman uh, woman's perspective it is very very challenging and very very enriching at the same time okay. I don't know if I have answered thank you Patrick thank you, thank you Patrick uh, are there any other questions that uh, any of our, um, I mean, those who are joining us would like to ask Dr. Marie. Uh, hi, thank you. Hi. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, and um, my question is on the sources for the myths that you've discussed, um, because you've mentioned plays mostly, um, ancient Greek plays, but also the Odyssey. Um, and that's, an area that I'm really interested in, um, and I haven't really started writing anything, but I'm, I've been thinking about it, and I was wondering what your thoughts are about working with these different sources of myths from different periods and maybe um, um, compiled or written down under different circumstances and in different uh, ways. <laughs> okay, Clara, I, I think uh, that uh, going back to classical sources is, um, it's very difficult you know, on the one hand, because it uh, requires a lot of um, reading. It is very difficult to establish the relationship between the classical source and the contemporary source without taking into account all the rewritings that have been produced in the meantime in order to understand well the final 
context of recreation, okay? But classical sources often, uh, or uh, they uh, are the, the, the main, um, the main texts to take into account in order to understand how those uh, spaces for uh, recreation uh, or with what intentions those spaces or recreations are created. If you go to um, Euripides, for instance, and you study women in Euripides, mm -hmm. you can understand how, how um, Marina Carr, what, which aspects is Marina Carr mainly interested in uh, adapting or rewriting, okay? Where is she determined to put the, the focus on, okay? Questions such as the chastity of women, or I don't know, sentences that uh, women said at Euripides times, such as, I can't speak if, if anybody could speak for me. And Marina Carr is, I think, is listening to those sources and say, okay, I will speak for you, okay? You made reference to the Odyssey, but uh, I, uh, I think also a very interesting analysis, someone mentioned here that, uh, you were interested also in, in the study of uh, eco criticism or the study of uh, nature, studying, for instance, the relationship between metamorphosis by Ovid, okay, and uh, the presence of nature in the place of Marina Carr, I think would also uh, be very, very interesting, okay, because nature is essential for her. Nature is a, is a refuge for women, okay, in many of, 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 of her plays, okay. So the possibilities are, are, are huge, but uh, I always go first to classical sources in order to, to, to see how women were uh, written at those times and how they are rewritten now in order to understand uh, well the processes of creation and recreation and the different contexts, okay? And it is a ton of bit surprising sometimes to, to find, for instance, that... Um, some conditions that women had to uh, stand in the Greece of the five, the fifth or the century BC still, or can still be identified in, in the place of Marina Carr. So what is Carr trying to say? Melissa Sira, for instance, in, in, in one of her books, uh, claims that uh, maybe uh, there are uh, still many issues related to women that need to be revised in, in contemporary Ireland, okay, if these similitudes can be established, okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Clara. Um, I'm not sure whether we have more time, uh, Dr. Rania, for any further questions. Um, I, I, I think it's time to wrap up. <laughs> All right, that's it. That's what I thought. <laughs> All right. So now, well, well, Dr. Maria, thank you. However, uh, if you would allow me uh, to conclude with one of your conclusions in one of your papers that was published in 2015, right. uh, entitled Myths in Crisis, Maria Carr's, Marina Carr's Revision of Feminine Myths in Contemporary Irish Theatre. Uh -huh. uh, I, I really, I would really like to end with that, that that was your conclusion. Okay. Because the myths are not in crisis in the place of Marina Ka and her contribution to the process of transfer that occurs as myths travel in time consists in recreating female mythological characters that are versions of Greek figures adapted to Irish contexts. Her women are monsters but passionate irrational but empowered, discarded but resistant. So thank yes. you very much. I really, yes, I really like that conclusion and thought it would be um, a very good conclusion to our seminar today. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you everybody for joining us and hoping to have other seminars of the sort whereby we'll all get, um, you know, we will benefit from, from all such presentations and ideas and the new ways of looking at the place. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Maria and uh, thank you, Dr. Mervet and Dr. Rania. We really enjoyed it. Very interesting, uh, very insightful and um, deep analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>